صباح الخير جميعا بحب رحب فيكم اليوم Good morning everyone allow me to welcome you today in this joint panel with the Arab Reform Initiative Our idea behind this panel is to continue a discussion that started seven years ago with ARI with regards to Tripoli. As you know, Tripoli was in the heart of the developments in Lebanon over the past two decades, but Tripoli, Tripoli was never an active city in terms of traditional uh, terms, but it was always a receiver. It has always been marginalized. Its image has been marginalized in uh, the media and in the political discourse. And this second city has been transformed into a scapegoat at the economic and political level. At the political level, we have seen a, a great number of members of parliament and ministers. However, that political representation did not put an end to that uh, image portrayed as if the city is a hub for extremism and terrorism. And that political representation never led to any developmental process for the city at the economic or social levels. Everyone knows the a high poverty rate, even before the current economic crisis, which has reached 50% even before, so let alone the percentages today. The city is a scapegoat, scapegoat in politics, which does not go hand in hand with, with its history, because it has always had an impact in um, history and throughout the history of Lebanon. It has always been an economic uh, uh, portal and gate towards uh, Damascus. It was considered as a hub with fields, uh, trees close to the sea, and known for its resources. It was known for its theaters and marketplaces. However, that pioneering role of Tripoli decreased over the past years. This is why we should always remember that the current uh, uh, approach is new. It has been created by uh, politicians who want to be popular more than they want to be leaders. This is why we need to put an end to that stereotype and we need to have an in-depth understanding of the needs of the city and its future. We hope today throughout this panel to join everyone we want this panel to be a part of our attempt to break those stereotypes and to launch the serious and in-depth discussion about challenges of Tripoli today, as well as the future of Tripoli as the city of revolution. Allow me to welcome you, everyone. Allow me to welcome the dear friends and colleagues who are all virtually meeting today. Allow me to also welcome my friend and colleague Nadim Huri, Huri from the Arab Reform Initiative. They are our main partner today. Nadim. Thank you, Maha. Good morning, everyone. I will not take long, but we are all pleased to see you all today. This is an opportunity. And as Maha said, this discussion actually started a long time time ago about the position of Lebanon, uh, the position of Tripoli and Lebanon. How do we perceive this city? We had a workshop in 2014 throughout an entire day about a similar topic, but at that time we had more hope and we had recommendations uh, submitted to the Lebanese authorities in order to revive those initiatives that started 20 or 30 years ago these initiatives that were kept in the drawers of the ministries and in the drawers of the political elite, and, and that also covers the elite of the city itself. This is one of the topics that will be discussed today between brackets. Today, we will be discussing this a bit differently. Seven years after that workshop, how can we understand the appropriate approach for understanding Tripoli away from the cliches, away from the stereotypes people still think or still say that Tripoli is a hub for terrorists. Unfortunately, this is the widespread perception. 
which has become part of the perception of the security agencies and the judiciary in Lebanon, as we have seen in some of the uh, charges pressed against the protesters, the terms of terrorism have been used in that case. And later on, we have seen the discourse of the city of revolution or the bride of the revolution, which is a contradic contradiction. It is an opportunity to think about these two contradictions. Another thing that is different from our discussion seven years ago is that this discussion is addressed to the uh, activists, the uh, these uh, the activist movements trying to find an alternative in Lebanon. How would they perceive Tripoli? What would be an alternative approach? What can they add? It's not enough to just say that we stand by your side, Tripoli. How do we translate that into actions? I am happy to see everyone today. That's it from my side, but but there is simultaneous translation for those of you on Zoom, um, and you can just click on the interpretation button on the uh, bottom right. Uh, Thank you, everyone. I will give the floor now to Jamil. He will be the first moderator for this discussion. Jamil, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nadim. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jamil Muawad. I am a senior fellow and the Arab uh, Reform Initiative. I am happy to be with you today. We will be discussing this uh, important topic. It is an opportunity and a space for us to think away from the chaos, away from the widespread discourse around politics in Lebanon and around the city of Tripoli in particular. We will be seizing this occasion today to try and look into it from a rational perspective, not only rational, by 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 thinking that we are outside and analyzing the city from outside but the main specificity is that all of the speakers are actually living in tripoli and this is what i mean by this rational perspective they are individuals living in tripoli working and dealing on a daily basis with the city which is essential to understand the political life of the city at the same time we also have the approach of a uh, researcher or a scholar who doesn't always have the chance to listen to this analysis, especially because of the current uh, discourse prevalent in the media because they have their own, own political agendas. We have with us three main speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Khaled Ziyada a university professor and researcher. He was also the uh, Lebanon's ambassador to Egypt. Dr. Nawaf Kabara is also a political sciences professor at Balamand University. And finally, we have with us Mrs. Alia Ibrahim, a writer, a journalist, and she has launched the Tarash.com website. We don't want this to be a lecture, but we want it to be a discussion a discussion around three main pillars. We will be starting with the main pillar and then we will be giving the opportunity for the three speakers to answer in order to make sure that this is an in-depth discussion rather than a lecture. The first topic that we will be discussing is related to this existing discourse right now about Tripoli, which has become a sort of a stigma. When we talk about uh, Tripoli, we immediately think about the stigma of poverty. This goes in hand in hand with uh, the mere mention of the name of the city. We need to see who is trying to disseminate this discourse. Why do we have this stigma in the city of Tripoli? The same discourse might not be real or it might. So this is the question, is it real or is it not real? Let us try to analyze this existing uh, discourse because we always look at it as if it's an exception, but I do not think that Tripoli is an exception. It's only one city out of other cities in this country also facing from the same crisis, the same political crisis. So the first question is addressed to Dr. Ziede, if we may start with you and then Dr. Kabara, and then we move to Alia. How do you explain this discourse? And why don't we hear more about the cultural wealth of Tripoli and what the city can actually give and what it might give to Lebanon? Why do we always consider Tripoli as an exception? Good afternoon. 
thank you for the question. Thank you for inviting me first and foremost. Thank you for taking the initiative to bring us together. And I think that your short intervention has a lot of positive remarks, a lot of ideas that can be up to discussion. I think that it is time to start the serious and scientific discussion about the city, about Tripoli. As you said, there are many slogans that are now widely spread inside the city and outside it, just like the example you gave us right now, which is the example of poverty. More than poverty, we can also say that it has been considered as the poorest city uh, on the Mediterranean and the Eastern coast. But this is a slogan that people would repeat without thinking twice about it. I wrote a week ago an article. I do not think that uh, Tripoli is uh, uh, poorest than uh, Tartus and Gaza and the other cities on the coast. Poverty does exist in Lebanon in multiple locations. Poverty definitely is not a value that we praise, and this is not a, an introduction to start and analyzing the situation of a city. It is only an indicator. I wonder sometimes why do people mentioned that it is the poorest city but at the same time it is the richest city in terms of uh, uh, people who are billionaires or uh, millionaires per capita definitely there is poverty however there are definitely scholars who have worked on uh, this topic we need to understand the historical relevance of this cause This is definitely an independent topic that requires a lot of time, but we have noticed a deterioration of livelihoods uh, since 1975, which is a milestone that no one would uh, pay attention to it because in 1975, 1976, or maybe a few years later on, we have noticed how parts of the residents left the city and went to its surrounding areas. This is an important phenomenon that people would not pay attention to. This has led to the closure of many factories, important factories that absorbed thousands of workers, such as the wood iron factories, the sugar factories at the entrance of the city of uh, Tripoli, from the south, south, southern entrance of the city. There is also the uh, migration, uh, people uh, leaving the villages to cities. So this is a major milestone that started with the civil war in 1975. People usually do not look at this uh, milestone because they focus more on the regions where fightings existed. Perhaps in uh, 77, 1977, after the assassination of Tony Frangia, the fightings and the clashes stopped in the north. So there was no uh, uh, front between Zgarta and Tripoli, but later on there were a few uh, uh, clashes or a few internal divisions inside the city and some internal clashes inside the city. It was more of an economic war launched against uh, Tripoli, more than a, a military war. So this is an important point to be discussed. After the war, after 1990, we have noticed expenditures happening, uh, targeting uh, development and reconstruction in the 90s. At that time, I think that Tripoli only received a very small proportion of those uh, expenditures for development and reconstruction. And we need to understand the reasons behind that. The Syrian tutorship uh, used to prevent the consecutive uh, governments, especially the governments of uh, Prime Minister Hariri. Uh, so the Syrian tutorship used to prevent the government from assisting uh, Tripoli and spending in Tripoli. It was not allowed for Prime Minister Hariri to conduct any political or economic activities in Tripoli. I remember the first municipal elections after the war. Prime Minister Hariri was not allowed to have his own candidates in the city because of the Syrian tutorship, even though he would have probably won in the municipal council. These are a few examples just to say 
that there are many reasons, many people responsible, many entities responsible, many uh, many facts that should be taken into consideration and that are, that are rarely taken into consideration. If we are talking about exceptions and the exception of Tripoli, I am against describing Tripoli as an exception. This is not a good point to start analyzing situation, but since there has been this exception, we need to remember that there were no militias controlling the region and extorting consecutive governments, which was the case in all of the regions. Everything, everywhere in Lebanon, there were militias after the war that became part of the uh, governing authorities. But in Tripoli, there were no militias, or, or at least there was no alliances between the so-called uh, uh, alliance between capitalists and militias. And this is a positive factor. However, it played a negative role in Tripoli because Tripoli is not governed by any of these militias. Needless for me to name them, because those militias are still um, are still governing Lebanon until today under different uh, names. That is an exception that Tripoli paid the price for. In Tripoli, we used to say we don't want any militias. We don't want one ruling party, but we want to uh, to uh, to to live our lives so perhaps tripoli is the only city where security agencies can reach anywhere i know that some regions in lebanon do not grant access for the security agencies and in certain municipalities in lebanon it is prevented for people to sell their real estate for people from different religions uh, tripoli is a city of diversity with poor people and rich pe people with businessmen and poor people but ever since 1975 it has paid the price it has paid this uh, price for the factors that i tried to mention mention them briefly I'm not sure if I have more time to discuss more and to delve into uh, more details about other uh, slogans. Even the, the residents of Tripoli might believe them in, on certain occasions or might consider them as a, a slogan that can be used to uh, explain the current situation of Tripoli, just like uh, the slogan of the bad relationship between Tripoli and the state ever since the establishment uh, of the Greater uh, Lebanon, which is not true. Ever since 1920, that cannot be applied to uh, Tripoli, and I can explain more. It does not uh, apply in 1943, and it does not apply later on because if we go back to those dates we can see that the political structure the political structure in 1920 included Tripoli Muhammad al jisr Sheikh Muhammad al jisr from Tripoli was the uh, prime uh, was, was the speaker of the house for five years in 1932 it seemed that he was about to be, be elected elected president because the constitution was uh, frozen at that time. So in other terms, Tripoli was an integral part of the establishment of Lebanon ever since the 1920s. It is true that they had objected in Tripoli to the idea of the French mandate, but even amongst all of the religions, some people objected to the um, French mandate and objected to the Greater Lebanon. Even the Shiites did so. And even amongst the Maronites who considered uh, themselves as uh, the main reason behind the establishment of the Greater of Lebanon, uh, the Greater Lebanon. The brother of uh, Patriarch uh, Hawaiik was also object objected also to the idea of uh, Greater Lebanon. Emil Ide, as you all know, objected to the same idea. And even amongst the Orthodox, there was also a certain percentage of people who objected because they would be um, under the Church of Antakya, which is based in Syria. This is why we need to reconsider that relationship between the state and Tripoli. Thank you, Dr. Ziada. I don't want to interrupt you, but the second pillar will be the relationship between uh, Tripoli and the state to see if it's under the 
auspices of the state or not. Thank you for this valuable intervention. Before I give the floor to Dr. Kabara, at the end of the Civil War, Michel Soral, the French researcher, asks Khalil Akawi from uh, Tripoli, what do you want? The answer is, I wish that there was a state. So all of the militias during the civil war never wanted a state, but inside Tripoli people wanted the state. Dr. Kabara, the floor is yours. Do you agree with that same perspective? Do you think that it, Tripoli is an exception, but it is a positive exception, not a, a negative one? Is Dr. Kabara still with us? I was logged out for a brief second. Can you please uh, raise the question again? Dr. Ziad just said that there is no negative exception. We cannot consider that Tripoli is outside the scope of the state. Perhaps it is a positive exception because the security agencies can access uh, every single part of Tripoli, unlike other regions in Lebanon. Do you agree with this? Do you agree with Dr. Zia? Did you consider that that exception as a positive one? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to my dear colleagues and friends. It's been a long while since I've seen you. Thank you, Maha, for organizing this, uh, this event and bringing us all together again. Tripoli, just like anywhere else, has its own specificities and at the same time, At the same time, we need to think what is the difference between Tripoli and Hermel? What is the difference between Tripoli and Saida or uh, Baalbek? Uh, how is it different from Tyr to a certain extent? With the exception of Beirut and some part of Mount Lebanon, all Lebanon actually is the same. They are all under development. The infrastructure is bad. We have the Par Paris site economy the proletariat so it's the same everywhere this is why when we talk about tripoli we need to focus on multiple elements first this city is constantly punished to be honest for multiple reasons it has been punished first during the independence because it was against the independence they wanted to be unified with Syria, but it was not the only city that wanted this unity with Syria. The same applies to Akkar, to Hermel, to the south. Uh, the south also did not want Greater Lebanon. They also wanted to be united with Syria. So it was a regional movement, not only uh, in Tripoli. Second, during the uh, era of uh, the uh, President Shahab, we have seen a certain recovery be because in that period of time, Tripoli had an important position in the project of Shahab. And ever since the 1960s, we have noticed a development movement from the states in Tripoli. This uh, can be shown in the refineries and in the stadium, which hasn't been opened yet. Later on, the next stage is the stage of the war. It was a destructive war, a destructive war for Tripoli because it crushed its economic role. It used to be the economic gate towards Syria. That role was crushed. It used to export, but because of the war, the uh, it started importing. And when, the, when Abu Ammar came to Tripoli and forced himself there against Syria, Tripoli was punished again in 19... Uh, 85. First, we need to remember in 1983, the war and the shelling of Tripoli. And in 1985, when the Syrian uh, army entered and uh, killed many people to crush the positions of Abu Ammar and Fatah and Tripoli. And at the end of the 1970s in Tripoli, they have created the so-called Jabal Mahsan Hubbani crisis between the Alawite and Sunnis as a tool used by the state to crush uh, Tripoli, to pressure Tripoli, and to transform it into a hub that can be used against uh, Syria. 
later on during the mandate of Hariri. Other than what Khalid uh, said, perhaps the Syrian tutorship did not allow the prime minister to spend uh, inside the, the Tripoli, but perhaps I have question marks about it. We need to remember that the Gulf countries prevented uh, Prime Minister Hariri of doing so, especially uh, um, uh, the Gulf countries because uh, the because the city was uh, against uh, against the Gulf. They did not want to support Tripoli. Uh, and I will tell you about a, an incident mentioned by uh, Dr. Hassan Malla. When Tripoli was shelled by the by the um, uh, uh, by uh, the uh, 1985 or during the 1985 incidents, the Saudi Arabian ambassador met with some dignitaries in Tripoli and told them choose 60 families, around 60 families, bring their names, we will give them some compensations and we will put an end to this situation in Tripoli. So they were just willing to pay that to Tripoli. And this is something that he has mentioned here in my own house. For those of you who know he, who he is, Tripoli is being punished today again. Tripoli has no representation in the government, but it's not only punished by others; it is also punished by its own people. Let me remind you the difference between or the uh, disagreement between Safadi and Mikati. It was an internal uh, problem. Sometimes the Lebanese politicians are so silly. They don't even have a project for Tripoli, and their own internal disagreements are not leading to any developmental projects in the city. Two to three weeks ago, Mikati said, what does Tripoli want? We are all distributing meat and food to Tripoli. So a person who received 23,000 votes, and this is his own perception of Tripoli. Imagine. There is an important thing, which is the uh, capitalism in Tripoli. And, and, uh, Nikati and Safadi did not uh, gather their fortune from Tripoli, but there are other people who gather their own fortune in Tripoli, but they do not invest in Tripoli. They don't uh, They don't establish hotels in Tripoli. Why not? It's not the job of the state to establish hotels. The lack of investments is also an important factor. The capitalists are not courageous enough. We need to also remember that the... Um, uh, the Christians have also left the city. They were the main engine behind the economic uh, situation and the dynamics of uh, the city. At that time, Tripoli was also divided amongst different movements. Khaled and I were in high school, and we used to remember how clashes and protests happened in the streets. It was a very tense situation, and the Muslims of Tripoli felt that the Christians, uh, especially Zgharta and Bshari, act as if they are better than them. So that was prevalent not only in Tripoli, but it also existed in Tripoli. I agree with what Khaled said. Tripoli is not the poorest city uh, on the coast. And we need to remember that it is truly rich. The exhibition alone, if it is launched, it will truly transform the city and the oil refinery can also truly change the city. The airport, which is only 20 kilometers away, can also transform the city. The infrastructure in the north exists. We do have a refinery, we do have the exhibition, we do have the airport, we do have the, the port. Today, unfortunately, after the blast of the Beirut uh, port, we have seen that the Tripoli port is booming and it has a lot of potential and the duty-free zone is not done yet, but it can be finished uh, uh, fast. Uh, Tripoli is wider, it is cheaper, it is linked to Turkey, it is linked to uh, Syria as well and to Iraq. And we also need to remember the uh, influence of Iraq. So there is a lot of uh, potential in Iraq. Thank you, Dr. Kabbara. I thank you. I don't want to interrupt you, but you have mentioned how the city is punished, even though it has a lot of resources, geographical resources, as well as financial resources, and uh, the uh, capital, uh, capital exists. And it is right now a hub, a hub for the neighboring countries, an economic hub and a livelihood hub. 
because in Zgarta, if we have a problem in our cars, we go to Tripoli to fix our cars for maintenance. Ali, let's go back to the same discourse. We have seen these two approaches from the two speakers. They have talked more from a historical perspective, the historical development of the discourse. I want to see how the media looks at this. If we want to look uh, from the perspective of journalists, how can this discourse change? Why do we only say that Tripoli is the poorest city on the Mediterranean, on the eastern coast, even though Gaza is poor? And how uh, does the uh, media deal with this situation? Who starts this, these prevailing discourses? First and foremost, I am happy to see the faces of my colleagues and friends. It's been a long time. My, Tripoli is my city. So I do not live in Tripoli. I live in Beirut, but it is still my city. There are many points that were very interesting and that we can, be dis that we can discuss from a media perspective. Let me focus first on the uh, exception. I think that it is an exaggeration. If Tripoli is an exception, the truth is that it has nothing to do with the stereotypes, with the stereotypes that have been prevalent in the past years, from Israel, as the Kandahar of Lebanon, and even today, considering it as the bride of the revolution, as if the entire province of the city has been and all of a sudden, by magic, it it has become the bride of the revolution. It moved from one stereotype to the other. What I want to highlight is the issue of poverty. It is true that Tripoli is not the poorest city, and we should not exaggerate. However, however, there is a political role of poverty in Tripoli. Certain neighborhoods have been become poor, and over years and years, Based on my media coverage in the past years, in the battles or between Rabat Mahsan and Dabit Kibbeni, and even whenever we have seen any political role for Jubilee in 2000 with the Al-Qaeda, and then to the different rounds of clashes every single time, there is a crisis in the country, it would spill over to Jubilee, and people would reach their balances. Is, uh, definitely, uh, uh, definitely delicate. It used to be a positive exception, but as a result, it has a negative role to play. It is not a poor uh, city, it is the second biggest city in Lebanon. It has a lot of nothing. It not have any impact on this region, the highest percentage of dropouts from school, the highest percentage of child labor. These are the factors, and over years and years, it doesn't lead to this disaster. I am not trying to are they working car maintenance for their other siblings? The sisters are in school. They would send the boy to work because he will be helping them earn money. The horizons were blocked. There were no horizons for social transitions. And there was also political discrimination that we have seen on multiple occasions over the years. If I want to give you a very specific example that I have always during the rounds of clashes that I have covered in Tripoli, ever since 2012, 
مرتبطه بالتشكيل الاساسي آه مثل قاده آه المحاور او مثل الخطه الامينيه هو البيت صار صار عندها لينجو صار عندها فوكابلي الى الى بالجولات الاولى صرنا ننتبه انه حتى التايمنج تبع التايمنج قديش بده يستمر القطيع التايمنج اند الديوريشن تقريبا بعد شي سنتين صار صار قاده المحاور يقدروا يقولوا لك انه قديش رح تضايق ليش كانوا يقدروا يقولوا لانه كانوا يقولوا Tell you how long would this last? How can they really estimate it? They would say we have been given, we have been given ammunition for this long. And at the end of this flash, and at the end of this fight, they would sell their weapons for hundred dollars, and they will live out of this one hundred dollars. It was obvious the link between political exploitation, political use, and the fighting on the other. It was very obvious, and it was concrete. Thank you, Alia. We will come back to this point in the second pillar. Dr. Ziadeh, when we talk about this prevalent discourse in Lebanon, Dr. Kabara also shed light to the idea of punishment. When we talk about the, this relationship, what are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, an economic approach? Who is against Tripoli? Do we feel that this is linked to uh, centralization? Is it paying the price for being close to Syria? What is its relationship to the state? Other than uh, it did not want to uh, be linked to Greater Lebanon in 1920, what is it? I disagree with idea. I disagree with the idea of this uh, relationship between the city and the state. With the establishment of uh, modern or contemporary uh, countries such as uh, Lebanon in 1920, definitely there would be contradictions between the abstract idea of the state on, and as, com as compared to the idea of groups. This has happened not only in Tripoli, it has happened everywhere. As I tried to say in my first intervention, if we look at the modern history of Lebanon until 1975, which, uh, which is from 1920 to 1975, we see that uh, Tripoli played an integral role in the establishment of the country. Without Tripoli, uh, this country couldn't have been the same way it is today. Over a hundred years, ever since the establishment of Greater Lebanon until today, there were seven uh, prime ministers from Tripoli, and one of them was in charge of the government eight times, and I'm referring to Rashid Karami. And if we look at uh, the statistics today, we can see that the longest period for a prime minister was Rashid Karami, not for uh, Rafiq Hariri or for anyone else. Tripoli has always been this integral part of the state. And the reform was done during the governments of Rashid Karami under President Shihab, the reform of the Lebanese University, of the Central Bank of Lebanon, of the Social Security Fund, etc. All of these reforms, these dozens of institutions were done by governments had by Rashid Karami. He is the one who had signed on these uh, reforms decrees. We cannot say that Tripoli never played a role, and we cannot say that, role, or that Tripoli was always against the state. It is not true. Moreover, let me tell you about the 1950s and the 1960s. In these, in these years, uh, Tripoli first launched the uh, uh, Tripoli port uh, launched by President Shamoun, and uh, that was also a government had by uh, Rashid Karami. And then the Abu Ali River expansion, which is an expansion expansion project which changed the entire uh, map of the city and it was supposed to have developmental uh, activities but unfortunately it had a negative impact and the same project uh, in the 
uh, period of President Shahab, which is the international exhibition of Tripoli. If it ha if it was finished, definitely it it could have transformed the city. So these are three projects launched by the state, not not by the municipality and not by individuals. These are major and massive projects, and they could have uh, changed the entire situation of Tripoli. Why haven't they worked? Definitely, the state is blamed because they have established the port and without supporting it, they have uh, established the exhibition without actually inaugurating it. And it wasn't finished yet. I want to draw your attention to an important point related to the uh, port and to the exhibition. There was a lot of pressure from the consecutive Syrian governments in the 1960s not to finish that international exhibition in order not to compete with the international Damascus exhibition, which was very well known at that time. And Lebanese from all of the regions used to go to Damascus to visit the international exhibition. It is something that is noteworthy. No one would dare to say it. We need to mention that. We need to uh, highlight the fact that it was linked to the regional situation at that time, and the consecutive governments in Syria were against the project as simple as that, and this is even before the 1970s. In order not to say that this is linked to the current regime, even in the 1950s and in the 1960s, the Syrian governments were against the project. These projects had a negative impact. I have talked about the 1950s and the 1960s, and the governments at that time wanted to ensure the development of a specific location, especially Tripoli, because it was the second biggest uh, city in Lebanon with, with a lot of potential and a lot of resources. In other terms, the relationship between Tripoli and the state and the deprivation of Tripoli should be clarified. This is the truth. Definitely, all over Lebanon, we need to have pressure coming from the city itself, from the region itself. Otherwise, the project will not be launched. Many projects took a lot of time. For instance, the highway between Beirut, Tripoli, which goes through many regions such as Kesruan, Batroun, Biblos, etc. It was adopted in the early 1950s, but it was finished after the end of the civil war. You might say that projects in Lebanon need a lot of time. Definitely, they need a lot of time because they need support from the people uh, uh, who are actually from that region. Definitely, this is added to the challenges, the other challenges of people refusing uh, a highway in their own real estate. Well, this is why we need to reconsider this stereotype. We need to reconsider this idea of the state trying to marginalize uh, Tripoli and to exclude it. We need to put an end to it because Tripoli had always played an important role and has always contributed and it all it, it had played an important role during President uh, Shahab uh, or under President Shahab, sorry. There are massive projects that uh, are, that are not seen anywhere else, such as the Tripoli port, which is now booming following the uh, explosion of the Beirut port. Once again, I want to talk about the Tripoli International Exhibition, which needs the initiatives from inside Tripoli. Let's be realistic and let's stop accusing other entities who are outside it, who are against it. Us, uh, the residents of Tripoli, people from Tripoli, let's launch an initiative for this important facility and see who is going to oppose us, uh, who is going to object. It does not mean that the state has always loved the Tripoli. It was not a love-love relationship. It is a critical uh, relationship, definitely, but it is not as it is described. The idea of deprivation is not fully accurate. This might lead to reactions, and I hope it does. That is the idea. You are trying to channel the discussion to uh, try and talk about Tripoli in its broader environment, not only the deprivation and the marginalization. Dr. Kabara, do you agree with Dr. Ziadeh? 
is uh, AAA facing the same problem that the entire country is facing, or do you still insist on the idea of punishments against AAA? Khalid said that Prime Minister Hariri was prevented from doing activities. This is a punishment. Is this an external decision? Yes, it is an external decision. I agree uh, on the idea of the Syrian pressure against the international exhibition. It is a punishment. Let's talk about the refinery and the relationship between the Tripoli refinery and Iraq, preventing it because it will have an influence uh, on Iraq. Definitely, it, Tripoli is at the intersection of regional political matters because of the, uh, the relationship with Iraq, because the relationship with Abdel Nasser, because of the relationship with the Palestinian uh, resistance, etc. We always blame each other and we always blame others. But let's look at Ehden. What did the state do in Ehden? It didn't do anything. You are the ones who created hotels in Ehden. You fixed restaurants in Ehden. You transformed Ehden into a beautiful city and a hub for tourists. And the road leading to Ehden is the only thing that the state gave you after a lot of effort. And the infrastructure doesn't even exist until today in Ehden. Nevertheless, you have transformed it into something because there is an active private sector that loves the city of Ehden. So the main question is the same question raised by Khaled. Why don't we love Tripoli the same way? I'm talking about the private sector. Do you have a high percentage of educated people and graduates? Tripoli used to have the best schools and the best elites. They have all left Tripoli because of the war, because nothing was left. But now, if we start projects, they would all come back because people would come after their interests. Even the Christians who have left Tripoli would immediately come back because of that uh, economic project. I am an, or an, an organization. I am part of an organization, and we... I uh, wanted to hire a financial manager. I had uh, uh, 60 candidates, including 50 people from Beirut and Mount Lebanon. So where they, whenever there are opportunities, people are willing to come because people want to work. They follow their interests. In certain occasions, the state did do something, but it's not enough the state has lagged behind in its duties, especially if we compare between Tripoli and other regions. And just like we have the South Council, regardless of the fact that it is a corrupt council, but definitely the Council of the South has developed projects in the South, but we did not see any, anything similar in Tripoli or uh, anywhere outside Beirut. Unfortunately, when the Tripoli International Exhibition was considered uh, as a, an exclusive uh, part for us, the uh, Sunnis of Beirut, the elite of Beirut, did not want to go to Tripoli. This is why they established Biel. There are millions of acres in front of you. It was built. And it hasn't been launched. It could have uh, provided job opportunities for thousands of people. It could have been become the hub of the city. Imagine if the exhibition was launched, what would the outcome be? We have lost uh, Dr. Kabbara. Let me move now. I forgot to mention the train station and the train railways are among the most important infrastructure in Tripoli, says Dr. Kabbara. By the way, the train used to come all the way to Wadi Khalid on the Syrian borders where we had the biggest market plates of the Middle East. So this is the idea of the marginalization. The market plates are still there. The train station is still there. We can go and see it. It was a hub bringing together the Lebanese liberal system regime as well as the Syrian regime at the same time. And it still plays an important role. Alia, the two gentlemen have talked about these uh, specific periods of time during which there were no uh, projects being launched, even though they were uh, 
being uh, um, started or established. How do you perceive the period of time after 2005? Allow me to disagree a little bit here. Even when we talk about Prime Minister Hariri preventing him from working in Tripoli, remember that Hariri passed away 15 years ago, and the Syrians also left Lebanon 15 years ago, and we have seen no active projects with a economic value from the exhibition to the port to the airport. So there are two main issues. First, there is an issue inside Tripoli, the competition among those who might benefit from the project themselves, and we would be expecting that disagreement in order to protract the central government would use that internal division to protract. When we talk about the positions of the Lebanese states, let's, let's consider, or let's think about this. How can people anywhere in the, the country be brought in hundreds and all accused of terrorists and all then released just for the purpose of helping one of the candidates in their elections. I am not trying to defend the confessional regime. I am not trying to defend the favoritism. But favoritism all over Lebanon means that people cannot be left years and years and years until they truly become terrorists and once they are released they will become part of the process. So I disagree with Dr. Nawab. It is clear that the private sector and the private sector play a role, but the private sector alone not الماضي بالنتيجة بالنتيجة كانت انعكاس لشعب السيري يعني ما في شيء مفاجئ everything that has happened was not sudden it was not surprising because it was happening in light of the policies used over years and years of time I am not trying to defend anyone here you have said that you have played an important role in the state it is true and we have noticed it in the past few years and we have noticed it in the past few years but it has stopped to years ago. Over the past 30 years, we have noticed no marginalization, no investments whatsoever in any production. But if a plan exists in Tripoli, if there is a difficulty, if there is a state that is truly doing its job, and if there is a political authority, a minister, and members of parliament to play an important role, definitely it could have been much better. Thank you, Alia. Thank you for this very rich discussion. Let's take a few questions now. If you have any questions, please raise them in the chat box and I will be reading them. We have an intervention from Khaldun Al-Sharif. He says that uh, the uh, security had an important role to play on uh, the lack of development. And with uh, Rafiq Al Hariri, Tripoli was not was not part of the development process because all of the developmental plans became or remained ink on paper. Another question about the role of municipality. This is a local authority, but it seems that the authority, this local authority, doesn't have a lot of powers. So, what would the municipality, uh, or what might the municipality do? What can the municipality actually uh, uh, do or what is the role of a municipality? Let me move to the last part. We have already diagnosed the situation. Who speaks on behalf of Tripoli? 
Is it the sons and the daughters of the city, the intellectuals, the activists who can speak on behalf of the Tripoli, the leaders of the fighting front lines? Who are you addressing this question to? To you, Dr. Ziad, this is the last question. I would like to mention that in my intervention, I have distinguished between two phases or two stages separated by the start of the war in 1975. The Tripoli before 1975 is not the same as after 1975 because of the closure of factories and people leaving the city, and many people coming from the rural areas, the political regional pressure on Tripoli ever since 1975. And from 1975 until today, we have been going into a, a continuous deterioration. Who speaks on behalf of Tripoli? This question comes at the right time. But however, if we compare Tripoli to Lebanon, we see that there are leaders who have exploited the fact that they can talk on behalf uh, uh, of their regions in Mount Lebanon in the south and everywhere else. But in Tripoli, the representation is a parliamentary representation. There is a certain consensus between different entities. Unfortunately, the voice of Tripoli ever since the 90s, ever since uh, the parliamentary life uh, return, the, the voice of Tripoli in the parliament was very low, even since the 90s. And I have mentioned the reason, but I don't want to, de to delve into to details. Because of the existence of other militias in the mountains and in other regions, those militias had more pressure and they had the resources to pressure. And it seems that the representatives of Tripoli after the assassination of Rashid al karami we cannot say that we have true leaders in Tripoli. And it is unfortunate that the elected representatives of Tripoli who were elected in, in the parliament haven't said anything over the past year and a half. And even before that, they never said anything or rarely did. Now we notice a quasi, um, uh, or we notice that they are not existent. They, there is no one to speak on behalf of Tripoli. I'm referring here to political entities and to civilian entities. And when we talk about the municipality, we need to know that the municipality does not have absolute powers according to the law. And even if you ask the head of the municipality, General Men Menkara, he talks a lot about the powers and the prerogatives that cannot be limited by the law, but they are limited by the political interventions of politicians who cannot intervene in the public policies. This is why they pressure the municipality for their own uh, smaller and uh, personal interests. I can give you the following example. Let's ask ourselves what is the stance of the uh, representatives of Tripoli of the um, mountain of uh, trash and garbage? This is uh, a cause that people always uh, nag uh, about. What is the uh, what is their uh, evaluation of the performance of the municipal council in Tripoli because they had an important role to play in their election? So the municipality today does not have full powers. And this is not because of the law and not because of their powers. The municipality should impose itself, even if the minister of interior try to limit it. But the law protects the municipality and the law grants it those powers initially. And if there are any obstructions from the center, central government, from the Ministry of Interior and Municipalities, in that case, the head of municipality can say that the allocations are not granted to us and we are not uh, given our uh, rights or our expenditures. So there is a low and limited political representation and civilian representation in Tripoli, which should be solved, to be honest. The sons and daughters of Tripoli because between brackets, we have the biggest percentage of university graduates. We have seven or eight universities in Tripoli. It is not poor in terms of its human and financial resources, but it seems that 
there is no good representation. Thank you very much. Based on your point, Dr. Kabara, you have mentioned that in addition to Mikati and Safadi and the millionaires, there is also another category of people in uh, Tripoli who are capitalists, who own the capital. But where, where are they? Because they are afraid of investing. Can you discuss this further? This is a question addressed to Dr. Kabara, just to go around uh, and to listen to all of the speakers. We cannot hear him. Can you hear me now? Khaled, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Let me remind Alia of something important. When Elias Lahrawi became president, the highway only used to reach Shika, not Tripoli. So Prime Minister Hariri made sure that it would reach Tripoli, and it uh, also created the highway to all the way to Ehden. So they link between Tripoli and uh, Shika, and they also link between Tripoli and Ehden, just to be uh, accurate. Now, with regards to Jamil's question, it is an essential question. And why are people afraid of investing inside Tripoli? If we look at the source of that wealth in Tripoli, if you look at how people made those fortunes, it's either from people who work abroad and who are sending their money to their families, building houses or buying houses, they mainly work in the Gulf countries or in Africa. And mostly those who were in Africa in the 1960s went to, to the Gulf in the 70s and in the 80s. And their projects are only buying the bungalows on the beach or launching a few projects by the beach and a few buildings, residential buildings. The second source of wealth in Tripoli is the traders who used to export to Syria and they have lost a lot because of the war. You also have the wealthy of the war. Many of them have created their wealth during the war. They did not invest a lot outside of the sector that they actually work in. The strategic question is why? There is something that Alia said that, that I agree with. First, there is no developmental plan and there is no, in, in the economic uh, mentality of Tripoli, there is no culture of tourism and there is no, uh, no culture of tourism. The culture of uh, uh, manufacturing exists with the Randur family and the Arida family, and it could have lasted if they thought uh, differently before closing their factories, but the war had an important role to play in closing down their factories. But now let me go back to Tripoli and Dakar. They have a lot of agricultural uh, production and uh, manufacturing, but why don't they invest in tourism just like people do everywhere else for instance in the mountains we see the private sectors investing a lot in june we also see the private sector investing a lot not so much in saida this is also um, uh, noticeable in, sh in the shuf mountains uh, to a certain extent so my question is why doesn't the private sector invest in that specific question so we need to see why is the private sector not investing in Tripoli. This is the non-Christian private sector, just to be blunt and honest here. The non-Christian private sector. I do not have an answer to your question, but it's uh, an idea or food for thought, perhaps because the private sector everywhere works under the auspices of politicians, including Shub, including Matrun, including Ehden, including uh, the different regions. So it brings us back to uh, point one, which is the political interference. Are we truly separating between the private sector, the capitalists and the political interference? Alia, there is a question to you. What is the role of the media? Is it only to 
tell people the truth or also transform uh, and change that stereotype. Let me answer this question. But first, I have two quick points to mention. With regard to the private sector and investors, I think that anywhere around the world, the investors are not courageous enough. They need to think twice before investing. Doctor, you were wondering if the Sunnis are investors and if they are willing to launch businesses. But other than that, the city of Tripoli today, at its entrance, has abandoned factories. I know for a fact that at the beginning of the economic crisis, there was an attack from Beirut to Tripoli, or there was a lot of attraction from Beirut to Tripoli because of the limited costs in Tripoli. But then the difficulties or the challenges were practical. So even to the rest of Lebanon, but the rest of Lebanon became poor just like and that's why Tripoli now looks like everywhere else because everywhere and everyone is facing this economic crisis. And that is why there was this moment of unity between Tripoli and the other cities because the rest of Lebanon joined Tripoli. Last week, I can give you the example of Dr. Rami Fajr who was called to justice because he was distributing food المواطنين وحتى برات نطاق طرابلس صداك إيجابي أكثر بكتير ويمثل نوعا ما أكثر بكتير من كل السلطاتيات أو كل النقطة في أزمة انتاجات يمكن أكيد لأنه كمان معاقل سياسية بتشكل هذا الفكرة لنوصل على كي شو دولة أنا بيرسن لي أنا كتاقية كتير متمسكة بدور التأليل للصحافة بصفتك بدور المهنة and the professional role of the media. In other words, they do not do lobbying. That said, it is unfortunate in the case of Tripoli because we, as journalists, never go to Tripoli for any work except for our documentaries. But usually we only go to Tripoli when there are bad news. These are the conditions can there be any change in the situation from a perspective? To chaos. Today we see that there is no trust between people and the judiciary without any understanding of who those people are. There is no trust in the judicial processes and there is no accountability from the parts of the prevalent media outlets. I think that we took 10 more times and we need to end uh, this uh, session. There are a few other questions about the role of Turkey in Tripoli or in the reconstruction of Syria and the future role of Tripoli in the reconstruction of Syria. There is also a question about the relationship between the states and Tripoli. I apologize because I cannot read all of your comments in the chat because we are short on time. A final word from the speakers, from Dr. Kabara, Dr. Ziade, and from Alia. Let me remind you of the questions about the protests and the, the revolutions. We have in the next panel dedicated for the revolution and the protests to talk more about the new voices in the city. A final words to Dr. Ziade. Thank you very much. Allow me to thank you first and foremost. 
This discussion definitely requires more than one hour in order to be as objective as possible and as impartial as possible. What I have said and what Nawaf have said might have been understood from a specific uh, angle or from a certain perspective, but I wanted us to reconsider some of the uh, may, uh, already known uh, points to channel this, this discussion. These are ideas that are not facts, and uh, I hope that everything that we have mentioned today would le pave the way for a second uh, session with uh, uh, more uh, speakers and more panelists. Definitely, there are ideas that can be discussed in detail, details and that can lead to further topics. Thank you very much, and I hope that we will meet again in another occasion. Thank you. Dr. Kabara, final words? Allow me to say that in one hour, we have raised many questions that require answers. It did not answer the questions, and this is essential. There are so many questions to be raised. And to be honest with you, now I have the intention of trying and finding, of, of finding uh, those answers. There are many factors that we cannot truly understand. Thank you very much, and I hope that we shall see you again in other I think that we deserve another webinar, and I hope that we will do it uh, very soon. Tripoli deserves another session. Thank you once again. I want to apologize if I couldn't read all your questions. The main problem is that people don't have answers. So definitely these are questions that we have raised and this is the right way in order to uh, understand a comprehensive approach. We can also summarize by saying that Tripoli is part of this country and discussing the problems of Tripoli is actually discussing the problems of the entire country and vice versa. Thank you once again. And I want to uh, remind you, the participants, I want to remind you that we have the next session at 5.30 and it will be talking more about the actual movement, about the protests and the initiatives of people who were part of that revolution. And they are one voice out of the different voices inside, inside the city. We will keep this Zoom session open. Uh, you can stay with us. Please uh, mute yourselves and please turn off your videos if you wish to stay with us. I feel like I'm a radio host right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamil. I know that many participants wanted to verbally take the floor, but unfortunately on Zoom, when we are more than 100 people, it is very difficult to give the floor to uh, everyone so that we give the floor to everyone. But it is obvious that many people are interested and they have valuable interventions. And Maha definitely agrees with me. We will try to find other opportunities to continue this discussion. We have at least one hour together. We will take 15 minutes break if anyone needs a break. And we want to thank the interpretation, which also needs a break for 15 minutes. Thank you very much.